Buzzword had arrived sometime in the middle of a commotion and had respectfully remained silent for the proceedings. We assured him that this wasn't a normal day and he politely smiled and nodded. We had really bared the sept's worst side. Not that violence and infighting was rare amongst the Garu, to be fair. On some septs, this would have been a normal Tuesday. But that didn't mean we wanted to advertise it to a glasswalker, who was also literally the VP of marketing for a big hotel in Quebec City. Thankfully, he remained professional and moved gracefully right past it. If he judged us any less for the brutality of us forest-dwelling Garu, this urban one didn't show it. We brought him to the laptop which we had kept under watch. Considering its previous owner, there was no way we'd take it anywhere near the Karen's heart or leave it out of sight from both Garu and Spirit. Very quickly we went into a major problem. Forests aren't known for having good Wi-Fi or electricity. Don't get me wrong, we had power. We had a couple of old generators spread around the periphery in case we needed to power the spotlights at night. But we didn't exactly have an office or a computer room. So he sat on a tree stump around the campfire and then tried really hard to still remain professional while he booted up the portable PC. He was um, clearly uncomfortable and annoyed. And I mean, to be fair, when we went to his sept, they had given us our own luxurious soundproofed hotel room on a floor reserved and designed exclusively for werewolves. He'd just about gotten to get into his groove when the computer suddenly ran out of power. It grew a few degrees colder. Gloria slowly put her hands protectively on a nearby kinfolk, pushing her away from the immaculately well-dressed werewolf with a pulsating vein on his forehead. The kin got the hint and drew back away, dragging a few more with her. This was not going to work. We really needed to move him somewhere more appropriate for this kind of work. The best we'd have was Jane's house. She didn't quite have Wi-Fi, but there would at least be an internet connection and swiveling chairs with wheels. Boy, we really knew how to roll out the red carpet. <sighs> so I sent out to find her, but found I couldn't bring myself to focus on this. I had to find Molly first. I asked around and was referred to Stormclaw's trailer, which, considering this had essentially started because of me, might have been tantamount to a death sentence for me to go there right about now, but I, I didn't care. I saw her outside on a makeshift cooking station warming up some broth, no doubt for her uncle. Werewolves heal fast, but Aaron... I mean, we were talking about a ripped out arm and serious spinal damage. It would heal in just a couple of days even. We're damned resilient, but it wouldn't be painless. And there may well be a permanent battle scar or two as a result that could impair his ability to fight for the rest of his life. So of course, as his kinfolk, it made sense that she'd be here to help him through his recovery. She showed strength and resolve. But I knew that she must have been a mess deep down inside. <sighs> Fuck this. Kinfolk really are the unsung heroes. Hey, yeah, I said, startling her. Jesus, horse! she exclaimed. I winced at the volume. I, I wasn't too keen on Aaron, even without functioning arms, to know that I was here. Too late for that, I thought, as I saw his packmate Whiptong's head pop through one of the windows almost immediately in response. She was probably making sure no one was coming to finish off the job while Aaron was in top shape. Sorry, sorry, I answered, deciding Molly was more important. Whiptong would come out to rip me a new one, or she wouldn't. I wasn't here for them. What do you want? Molly snapped. I am... Um wanted to check you out? I stammered like a damn schoolboy. I mean, check on you. I mean, are you okay? I finally managed to say. I saw her make an effort to soften up. I'm, I'm not, she admitted. But thank you for asking. Sorry, I snapped. Oh, please, Molly, I said. You spent most of your days surrounded by moody werewolves. If someone's ever had more than her share of people snapping at her 
and far too few of them apologizing for it. It's you. Snap away if it makes you feel better, please. She smiled a little. Nah, I don't wanna. Not at you, anyway. I looked at her and smiled back. I didn't know why I had come other than to comfort her. Just to be with her, maybe. And now that I was, I had no idea what to say. So galliard I was. Need any help? I proposed. Stay the hell away from my food, she answered, emphasizing for humor. Although she probably meant it in a certain way. Like many good cooks, she didn't like people messing with their art. I laughed and found the places set nearby on the ground, leaning on one of Stormcloud's trailer's large wheels. Just being there, you know, showing her she wasn't alone, that she mattered. It took a bit before either of us were ready to delve into any of the big topics. Wasn't even sure we would. Not so soon. But eventually, she came to sit next to me. So, I guess you figured out I hadn't quite managed to talk him out of any of this nonsense, she eventually said. He makes his own choices, Molly. None of this is on you, I said. Or on you she answered. So, we're good? I asked, hope and despair on my tongue. We are. Well, of course we are. She leaned her head back on my shoulder. But I don't know if me and Aaron are. Not after this. I'll, I'll help him heal back, but I won't stand for this. I don't care that I'm his kinfolk. Nothing gives him the right and dragging Dreadhorn and Gloria into it? A duel to the death? For what? For me? For some decade-old grudge? Both? All of it? It's just... It's too much. You'll take flack for this, I said before thinking. A kin? Abandoning your Garu? That's basically unheard of. Yeah, well, that's his call. She snapped back. Either he makes amends or I'm gone. And I'm not his property. I'm family, goddammit. Of course, of course, I said. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean otherwise, but some more traditional-minded folks won't see it like that. Fuck them, she said simply. Fuck them, I agreed. And we kissed. She got back up to finishing preparing the broth. I should go. I need to find Jane, I said, preparing my exit. Sure. The laptop. I understand. Rain check for tonight, anyway. I need to talk to my big lug of an uncle. You go. And go be a hero, she replied. And thanks for being supportive. I got up, too. Kissed her one last time and left. I found Jane not too long after that, coming out of another trailer nearby. I brought her up to speed, and we came up with a plan to sneak Buzzword into her room as a computer tech coming to fix our modem. We couldn't quite find an excuse for me, Firehound, and Gloria, so we just snuck up the window while Jill greeted Buzzword in front. With the laptop now plugged in, the glasswalker got to work his magic. It wasn't too long before he confirmed that there was a bane inside of it, making it very difficult to hack into the files. He hooked up his own laptop on Jane's landline and made a call to a friend to talk business. Buzzword was very good at marketing, and hacking, but as a galliard, he was less good at the spirit stuff. While they talked shop, I explained to Jane that spirits could possess objects, as well as people, and in fact, we Garu did this on purpose. The result was called a fetish, essentially a magical artifact that could serve a myriad of purposes. I showed her my own sash, bound with the spirit of a warm summer breeze. It wasn't one of those fancy fetish that Garu would fight over, but... Mine was more of a practical one. It was centuries old, passed down from one silent strider to another. When I activated, by speaking to the spirit inside and managed to convince it to assist me, he keeps me warm, even in the coldest nights on the road, even under the heaviest of rain or sleet. I wake up warm and dry. On the other end of the spectrum, Gloria explained that the Silver Fangs forge great swords of silver called Grand Claves where not one but two spirits are bound, creating works of such power 
that wars have been fought over them. Like mine, she said longingly, looking far into the distance in the realm of memories. My brother carries it. Yet I was born first. I should have inherited it, but I was never born. I was not allowed to exist, much less carry the very pride of my lineage. Sun Cleaver belongs to me, but I have never even held it. The very notion clearly brought her great pain, so I quickly stepped in. There are two ways to make fetishes. You can defeat a spirit until it is just about to fall into slumber and force it into an object, or you do it the honorable way. Fetish carry great status, but also often great power. Spirits understand our need for them, and will often willingly agree to do the binding. But the least we can do is make sure this new permanent residence is pleasant. They're sacrificing a lot on our behalf. It's only fair that we put effort into this. Handmade is regular, frequent. But if that's not an option, there are many ways to properly prepare a suitable receptacle. You can carve glyphs or decorate it with all kinds of elements pleasant to the spirit. If the spirit says no, then you go back to the drawing board and you put some more effort into it. For the most powerful fetishes, thurges can spend months and even years gathering suitable materials to craft the perfect bow or the perfect dagger. Sometimes going on quests to find legendary claws, unique magical metals, or just to dedicate their victory to the spirit they're trying to convince. These aren't mere trinkets. It's an honor to carry one. <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt, Buzzword said, interrupting. I'm going to need a few things to trick this bane. I'll be back in a few. Don't touch either laptops while I'm gone. I leave you with my friends, Peaks in the Web's voice. And without a word, he just left us with the stranger on his screen. Hi, Jane said, a little shy. We all said hi, too. It was awkward. We presented ourselves. So, you do this a lot as a glass walker? You troubleshoot spirits? Speaks laughed a little. Yeah, more than one might imagine, considering I'm not a glass walker. None of us got it. Of course, Garu of any tribe could be great at computers, but she was good enough that a glass walker called her for help. And she wasn't glass walker herself? We were impressed. Sorry, speaks in the web's voice. I'm new. I'm a cub. I'm confused. Are you bone nower? She laughed again. Not in a cruel or mean way, but clearly this wasn't the first time this was happening. No, child. I'm actually a member of Older Brothers Tribe. Oh, but you're not Native American. I, I thought that you were because of the story of how you crossed. I'm sorry, am I, am I being insensitive? I sense no malice in your question. You're not mistaken, not entirely. In the early days, the younger, middle, and older brother tribes crossed the seas together to the Americas and established in the Pure Lands. Younger brother took up the frozen north, middle brother took to the middle, and we settled in the south. Together we kept those lands safe for a long time. We were not alone. We had allies from the other local shapeshifters. We defeated great evil here. Some evil had run rampant for millennia, unchallenged, until we arrived, and had grown so powerful they simply could not be felled. Those we could not destroy, we bound. For that is what we do. That is what we are. Our patron, a great water serpent, is a dangerous and vicious beast, but one of our ancestors won its trust and respect, and he has been teaching us ever since. Under his tutelage, we learned that under this veneer of violence, he is, in fact, quite patient and wise. He taught us to seek out secrets, even the darkest, most dangerous ones, the kind that can break your mind. For even if we lose some to our madness, what we learn can help us undo the worm. And with these secrets, we learn dances and chats to lull even the most powerful banes to sleep and bind them forever. Or at least as long as the proper rituals are maintained. And so, we kept it dormant for years and years. As you probably know, when European ships landed, things took a dark turn. We lost a lot of land to war and strife. 
Some of those terrible creatures broke free and new ones were born from the conflict. It took time and lives to fix this. And by the time the dust settled, the Croatan middle brother was gone forever. The worm used the opportunity of this madness, the human on human wars, the Garou on Garou wars, the Garou on changing breed wars, the wars to recapture impossibly powerful banes. He used all that to unleash a terrible tragedy himself. Or rather, one third of himself, the eater of souls. The Garou, native or European, could not scramble an answer in time, but middle brother, brave and noble middle brother, acted before it was too late. They gathered the entire tribe in a binding ritual so powerful it required the sacrifice of the tribe, not just its members, but the concept of the tribe itself. In order to bind Eater of Souls out of the physical realm forever, they gave all of their lives. Their patron spirit has never been heard from since. None of their kinfolk have bred true since that day. An entire tribe gone forever. Perhaps in response to that defeat, less than a century later the worm struck again. As the worm bringers laid the foundation of the railroad, one of the great banes we'd bound came face to face with one of the weaver's great new spirits. The two spirits fought, but instead of destroying each other, they somehow merged into something greater than their individual parts, and the Storm Eater was born. For sixty years we were helpless against it. It ravaged the Umbra and consumed any spirit of the wild it found, leaving behind terrible banes and new weaver spirits alike. But again, this is what we do. We found a way to bring it down, studying the great bane, learning from it. Binding this creature would require sacrifice. One hero from each of the 13 tribes. Native and European werewolves would have to learn to work together to do this. The price paid was great, the damage irreparable, but at least the Storm Eater was bound, and still is to this day. And this brings us to me, Speaks in the Web's voice said. After this day, we chose to work towards the future, towards healing and fixing the great mistakes of the past. We reached out to all cultures. We mingled with all of them. The older brother tribe of today isn't limited to Native Americans, though they still are much more numerous. We have among our kinfolk and tribe members folks of all skin colors. As a result, we do not just fight to give a voice to Native Americans, but all people of color. We have a good number of activists who, every day, fight in the streets and in the courtrooms to open doors, to change minds, to raise awareness, to fight legislation, to fucking bring back electricity and basic amenities to communities that our government and big corporation would rather abandon. Jane had been listening to every word, fascinated. You sound extremely cool, she finally said when Speaks was done. We are, Speaks replied shamelessly, though few think so. What? Why? Jane asked, genuinely puzzled. Well, well, this is turning into quite the tribal expose, isn't it? Speaks said. Oh, right, Jane responded. Sorry, it's sort of what I've been doing for a while now. I'm learning about all the tribes, and I've been talking to members from each of them. Do you mind? No, no, dear, it's just unexpected. All right, then. So, here's the thing. Folks don't like us for two big reasons. One, they don't trust us. Not everyone understands the wisdom of actually seeking out the worm to learn from it. Even if we have the best of intentions, and have frequently saved the day with what we've learned, such as against the Storm Eater, lots of folks can't get past the danger of exposing ourselves to such vile darkness. Fewer still understand the necessity of keeping Banes alive. Many assume it will backfire at best, or that we have ulterior motives at worst. But why, though? if I may. As I said, some of these can't be killed. It might be that back in the era of legends, when logic and physics were more suggestions, Europeans' werewolves were a match for such creatures. And maybe by the time we got here in the Pure Lands, that window was gone, 
I don't know, but the fact is, here, we have Banes that are so powerful, we have no clue how to kill them. Probably there are a few we might manage to kill at prices we can't afford to pay. But we're not get a Fenris. We don't count glory by how many of ours died in a fight. We'd rather fight wisely and keep as many people safe and ready for the next battle. If the toll of death we would have to take is significant, isn't it better and wiser to handle it with a song and a dance and just a few unfortunate casualties? Sure, it will still be alive, but if we can keep it asleep forever, what's the difference? That makes sense, agreed Jane. It's risky, but I see the gamble you're making. <laughs> How open-minded of you, answered Speaks in the Web's voice with a smile. The other reason many Garu fear us is because of our patron. The Great Serpent does share his shape with that of the worm, and to many that is sufficient. Poison and toxins are often associated with the worm, too. And he does drip venom. Our great spirit's gaze, when withheld, carries a curse that kills. We know our patron is not easy to accept, but he's been kind to us. He's guided us in his way, nurtured us, and made us into the inquisitive and curious people that we are, able to gaze into the abyss as it gazes back into us, as they say. And often enough, we managed to get away with it, armed with lost secrets to save the day. I don't know that I would have the courage to do what you do, Jane said, but thank you for the time you have afforded me today. I have learned much. You're most welcome. Ten minutes later, Buzzword came back, and together with Speaks and the Web's voice, they worked out a way to confuse the Bane long enough for Buzzword to work as magic. The Bane was tricked into transferring its essence into a DVD, and it was safely removed from the device altogether. We were impressed by Speaks and the Web's voice knowledge of computers, and found out that Older Brother doesn't just spy on the worm. In fact, they have members of the tribe just as focused on learning all the secrets of the Wild and the Weaver. She herself was a member of one such faction called the Web Walkers. I'm not ashamed to admit I learned about as much on that tribe as Jane did that day. And they have my utmost respect, both for what they do as Garu, but also for their actions as activists, making the human world a better place. A safer place for everyone. By the time they were done, we were reading printouts of emails and social media accounts. Within a couple of hours, we finally had a general idea of what was going on. The school was infiltrated by black spiral dancers. They had a long-term plan to corrupt the minds of the next generation of humans Kin and Garu. But Evan, the custodial, had burned a few steps by releasing the USB keys without his pack's knowledge. They were not happy about it. They wanted to shape minds, not kill them. Even better, we now had names. Mr. Irwin, the counselor. Jane's counselor, in fact. Mr. Lively, the secretary. And Miss Ale, the principal. And just like that, we finally had our targets. It was time to end this. This has been A Right to Remember, Season 2, Episode 17. A series of lore videos for Legacy Werewolf the Apocalypse presented through an immersive narrative. Yet another tribe that's often misunderstood. They're usually regarded as the other Native American tribe, but there's so much more than that. Along with the Children of Gaia, the Glasswalkers, the Bone Hours, and the Black Fury, they are perfect for an urban or activism, or both, based chronicle. People keep thinking only the Bone Hour and Glasswalker spend time in cities, and they're dead wrong. All of these tribes have business in town, working to help or protect communities they hold dear, dealing with important social and political issues. Hopefully, if you once believed that Werewolf wasn't political, even back in the 90s, you now see that it is woven into every line of ink. You see that literally half the tribes are very concerned with social issues. And that as a whole, the game is about more than just being a violent Captain Planet spin-off. The other thing people tend to only focus on when it comes to Older Brother is the spirit thing. Usually seen as the experts on all things spirit, they are often picked for Thurges in the same way the Aram players often pick Get a Fenris or Younger Brother. But that's missing the point. 
playing older brother isn't about being an expert. It's about risking everything to become one. It's about being driven by an insatiable curiosity that will drive you deeper and deeper into dark mysteries you may not come back from. Tales like that need thurges, for sure. But they also need warriors, leaders, scouts, and people to tell the cautionary tale when all is lost. Older Brother is known for its excellent thurges, but they are an excellent tribe for all auspices. Think of it like this. Would Lovecraftian stories work if all the characters were spell-slinging wizards? No! Some characters are mystics, but you need all kinds of characters to make it work. And if it wasn't obvious yet, Older Brother stories are exactly that. Lovecraftian. So branch out, be Ragabash, be Philodox, and be curious. More curious than you should ever be. Don't stop looking for secrets. That's what playing Older Brother is all about. Now, usually I skip talking in detail about the camps. But in the case of this tribe, I really think they're very good. Often camps are just ideologies. Members of the same tribe don't have to agree on the direction or the goals of the tribe, and it makes sense to present many different viewpoints. I agree on that. But breaking it down into camps essentially means adding a fourth choice to make. In addition to breed, auspice, and tribe, it gets heavy. Here the camps are not ideologies. They are a way to fine-tune what you want to engage with. You want to delve into dark, deep secrets of the wild? Inside of the worm? Welcome to the Children of the Wild camp. Want to do that with the weaver? Be a web walker, like speaks in the web's voice. Want to delve too deep into the otherworldly secrets of the Umbra? Join the Skywalkers. Terrible name, I know. Want to focus on activism? Go ahead and play as an Earth Guide. They broke down every way to play the tribe and made those into camps. And I'm here for that. In 5th edition, the tribe is now the Ghost Council. Taking part in activism has been completely removed, which is sad. As we've said, Werewolf the Apocalypse was always a political game, and now that's mostly been relegated to the Black Furies, which are canonically stated to be bad at it. Would one tribe that's actually decent at it been too much to ask? At least they're still all about learning dark secrets, even taboo secrets, and using them against the enemies of Gaia. So there's that. But it means now that Bone Nowers, Sun Striders, Ghost Councils, and even the Children of Gaia all deal with mystery slash secrets slash information in some form as well. They all specialize in different things and do things differently, for sure. That's still a lot of potential overlap. Join us next episode for the Red Talons. If you dare.